they are also co-authors, or as you can see, it's a long list of co-authors of the paper that will appear hopefully soon in theory and psychology. It's a kind of forthcoming. So um, uh, just a content warning in this presentation, I focus on young people who um, had to access mental health care emergency services in the UK. Um, that's mainly for um, issues having to do with their mood. Uh, so there will be um, in the talk references to uh, suicide and self-harm. Okay, so this is the research team. Um, I, I'm a philosopher. Uh, Clara Bergen is a sociologist. Uh, Rose McCabe, a psychologist. Clara and Rose work on conversation analysis. This is a methodology, qualitative methodology, um, that um, requires uh, analyzing conversations, real life conversations, in a number of ways, looking at you know, the words that people use, but also the nonverbal uh, cues in the conversation, such as gaze, where people look uh, when they're talking, um, posture, whether they're leaning in, whether they're not leaning in, uh, whether they are kind of distracted or not, the tone as well of, uh, of their words. So whether they um, are, uh, for instance, an ascending tone or, or, or a different type of tone. And all of this, um, not surprisingly, has an effect on how the conversation goes. And they specialize in analyzing conversations. So video recorded, of course, because they need the verbal and nonverbal cues among mental health care practitioners and patients. Um, in this particular project, we're looking at young people, but they have wide experience with other types of patients, especially mental health, for instance, dementia. Rachel Temple works for the McPean Foundation, which is a charity working uh, with people, young people who have experience of mental health. And what she does is youth involvement. So she facilitates the presence of young people in these projects and their participation in all aspects, as I was saying earlier of the project. Michael Larkin is a clinical psychologist at Aston and Matthew Broom is both a psychiatrist, clinical and academic, and the philosopher at Birmingham is the director of the Institute of Mental Health. Okay, so we can proceed. What did we do? Um, Clara and Rose had a number of uh, data that they collected for previous projects. They're video recording of interactions between mental health care practitioners, which could be mm, mental health nurses or consultants, and young people presenting with um, an emergency situation. Um, we have these videos, they are available to watch. Uh, we cannot show them online, no? um, we don't have permission to do that. So when I'm referring to some of the extracts from these conversations, uh, Anna will help me, we will reenact those conversations for you. Um, it's not the same as watching the videos, at the same time, it's a good approximation. Um, so we are looking at this data um, which was, of course, uh, gathered with consent from everybody involved. There was no researcher in the room. Um, so these were recorded conversations between healthcare practitioners and young people. The project um, in the title has the word agency, um, and your seminar series is about agency. Um, agency, though, is quite a contested word that in every discipline has um, different definitions and interpretations, and in philosophy, a number of definitions um, without having to go to another discipline. Uh, we wanted to use a notion of agency that even our young um, experts by experience could understand and use. So we are um, kind of employing a very uh, down-to-earth, straightforward notion of agency. The idea is that someone is an agent if they have the capacity to intervene that in the environment that surrounds them. That could be the physical environment or the social environment. And um, the way they intervene in the environment is because they've got some interests and some goals and they intend to pursue those interests and goals. When we're thinking about how young people feel when they approach services, we're not just thinking about whether they have agency. We're thinking about whether they feel like they have agency. They feel like agents. So uh, if you want to use uh, a terminology that is used in psychology, the difference would be between actual agency and perceived agency. Do they feel like 
they have the capacity to intervene? Do they feel like they can contribute to the conversation? They can express uh, preferences about their treatment. They can actually uh, talk about their experiences in the way in which the experiences feel to them. Our impression from watching the videos and looking at how young people uh, with experience of mental health reacted to the videos is that unfortunately in many of these encounters, the young person was feeling disempowered by the conversation that they were having with mental health care practitioners. So they ended up feeling less like agents at the end of the encounter than they felt when they approached services, uh, even if they approach services in a moment of crisis, because I, I remind you that these are emer emergency services. What happened in the actual gathering of the data is that um, the young person who accessed the services was interviewed before and after the encounter. And he was also, the person was also interviewed um, quite a few um, weeks after the encounter. And so that um, the researcher could get a sense of how the person felt about the encounter at different moments in um, their uh, mental health journey. So when, it, when does it happen that the person um, has a sense of agency, so feels like an agent? Well, a typical example of someone who feels like an agent, this could happen to all of us, is when we have a goal, we have something that we are really passionate about. We find quite a lot of obstacles on our way to achieving that goal, but finally we get it. So that is a moment where we feel like agentic, you know, we really feel like agents because we feel that we have intervened in the environment and we have changed things in a way that has benefited us, that makes sense to us, that makes our uh, life meaningful. When is it that we don't feel like agents? Um, the obvious example is when we are victims of uh, crime or abuse, you know, when, when we feel helpless, when we feel like, you know, we, could have, we couldn't have done anything to avoid something horrible that happened to us. So people, for instance, who escape areas of conflict, people who have uh, sustained periods of poor mental health feel in this way, helpless, hopeless, you know, there is nothing I can do. Um, and, and they feel, you know, that there is very little that they uh, can intervene in that environment. When we're looking at young people who access mental health care services, uh, there are a number of factors that, according to us, make them even more vulnerable to feel hopeless, to feel not like agents, more vulnerable than other populations. And so initially, just before looking at these data, uh, we tried to put on paper what we thought were the main factors, also based on previous research that has been done. One important aspect of people going, uh, in the, uh, people in this age group, so we said 18 to 24, is that it's an area of transition for many of them. Uh, whenever there is a transition in a young person's life, um, there, is, uh, there are difficulties that uh, for some young people mean also kind of anxiety or fear um, because the people um, they um, are trusting, the people of reference, you know, their teachers maybe, their parents, their peer group may change. So people in this um, age group uh, move from relying mostly on, on their parents and teachers to relying mostly on their peers and also very often move from school to work or from school to university. So there are lots of transitioning process that make this period quite challenging for them. Moreover, their identities are still developing. Um, so they are still finding themselves. They're still finding what makes them um, tick, what, what is important to them, how they want to spend their life and so on. If they've had experiences of poor mental health, they might also have experienced distressing events who've had anomalous experiences that make them even more vulnerable to feeling like they are not in control. Um, when they are meeting healthcare professionals, but also when they're meeting their teachers or adults in their lives that are important, we also have to consider that unfortunately there are some negative stereotypes associated with young people. Young people are often defined as restless or lazy um, if in particular they access services for mental health issues. They may be considered like attention seeking, which is a very discriminatory label attached to people, for instance, with diagnosis of personality disorder or simply lacking maturity experience or resilience. 
uh, unfortunately, these kind of things can be seen in the popular press, at least in the UK, I'm sure it's the same here. Very often young people are dismissed. Uh, you know, when people com young people complain about things, you know, there's no flakes, you know, they, they haven't been through uh, real challenges. So they don't really know what they're talking about. I think that <laughs> won't happen much uh, for much longer, given the times in which we live in, because our young people, unfortunately, have had a lot to contend with. But, um, but that's, that's certainly something in the popular culture. Um, the other point, which is actually related to the previous point, is that young people um, find it easier to internalize um, other people's judgments about themselves. Um, so if, if a teacher or, or a doctor or someone in a position of authority makes them uh, think that they are worthless or they are being lazy, it's much easier for them to doubt themselves and think, oh, maybe I am lazy, maybe I am worthless. Not because they cannot think for themselves, but because as we saw, uh, their identities are still developing and the important people in their life have more uh, kind of influence on how they think about themselves than, um, than at later stages in life when they've had their own experiences, when they've had a number of experiences, have lived through a number of situations and they can make their own conclusions about themselves. There are a number of aspects of agency that we feel are particularly threatened in the clinical encounter where uh, a mental health care professional meets a young person. And some of them point to a particular type of agency, epistemic agency. Epistemic agency is about agency in the context of what we can know, whether we can produce and share knowledge in a credible authoritative way when uh, the prejudices against us make people think that we cannot produce or share knowledge uh, in an authoritative and credible way, um, but those are just stereotypes, um, we may have cases of epistemic injustice, which is a word that is used more and more in the healthcare context to indicate those situations where you dismiss someone's report, someone's testimony, someone's way of feeling, just because you associate with that person some kind of negative feature um, according to the groups to which this person belongs. So it could be their gender, their sexuality, their age, their ethnicity, anything at all. And when um, many aspects of your own identity are stigmatized and stereotyped, these kind of things can be layered. So if you're a woman, for instance, from an ethnic minority who looks overweight and so on, all of these things may work against you. Okay, so what are the aspects of agency that we will look at? Uh, we will look at validation. So an agent is a subject of experience and their perspective matters. So the moment that the person dealing with you treats you as a subject of experience with an important perspective, they validate your experiences. An agent can take action to change their situation by seeking help. So it's important in healthcare encounters that the person you're meeting legitimizes your help seeking. So recognizes that there is a good reason why you sought help and uh, you're deserving of attention. An agent may have multiple and conflicting needs and interests. So again, it's really important to consider the person in front of you, not just as a problem, not just as a diagnosis, but as a person. So with a complexity to them, uh, a multiplicity of needs and interests that sometimes don't fit together very well. Um, and this helps you refrain from objectifying the person in front of you. With adequate support, so not by themselves, um, an agent can contribute to positive change. So I think this is very core aspect of agency. Remember, intervene in the physical environment, in the social environment, as to bring about their goals. So it's very important to affirm the capacity that the person has to contribute to change. Um, with adequate support, an agent can participate in decision making, even in a situation of crisis, even when the person feels vulnerable, they may have a contribution to make to a decision. Um, in the healthcare context, it could be what treatment uh, could be best, or who, who best could support you in this moment. So it's important that the decision is a collaborative decision between the healthcare professional and the patient and the person in front of them. If there is no collaboration, the healthcare professional may make a decision that doesn't actually fit with the life of the person in front of them. Maybe good on, on paper, but may not actually be practical for, for that particular person. So let's start with validation and legitimization, which are really strongly linked. Um, and according to our young people who have lived experience, they are the most important steps. 
and the ones that unfortunately are still missing very often from healthcare encounters. So what is validation? If you look at how validation is manifested in a conversation, in a dialogue, um, it can be very simple, basic things um, that you don't normally even have to think about. Listening attentively, um, accepting what the person says. Accepting doesn't mean that you have to believe that what they say is true, but you have to take into account what their point of view is on that particular issue. Showing empathy, showing that you care, showing that what they say is important, and avoiding judgment. We will come back to that later. So these in the words of our young researchers. By kind of bypassing those feelings, it's kind of like almost implicitly telling the person, okay, your feelings are a problem. I'm uncomfortable with your feelings. We're not going to talk about them. We're just going to fix them. It almost amplifies the young person's distress because they are struggling to sit with the feelings and they're seeking help. So showing interest for what, how the person is experiencing things is really important, even if there is no easy solution to come after uh, you have listened to them. Legitimization um, is actually the recognition that the person has already achieved a lot by seeking help, uh, has already made this very important first step to improve their mental health. So um, the practitioner should treat the person as deserving support, um, as having a right to seek help, and having um, a legitimate concern about their mental health, rather than being dismissed. Unfortunately, what we find with young people, and this happens more if the young person is an articulate, intelligent person who can speak for themselves, is that the practitioner minimizes the problem. It's almost the, almost the idea is that, oh, you can't be unwell, and be so articulate in describing what you're going through. And this is unfortunately a problem that um, is particularly uh, serious with university students seeking for help. They are sent from the university counseling services to the emergency services in situations where um, you know, they, they may want to end their lives, for instance, or they are thought to want to end their lives. But then emergency services find them almost you know, too knowledgeable and articulate and in control to, to needing help, um, which is something that we saw again and again in the, in the videos. With that sort of interaction of, oh, it's fine. You know, the department said it's not an issue, so it's fine, um, sort of having those thoughts. Or you wouldn't think, well, maybe it's really serious. Maybe I do need to tell someone to help me. And you don't want to go seek help again because of what happened previously. So here the young people are telling you that if you go and see a practitioner and takes a lot of courage to do that, especially in a moment of crisis, and the practitioner tells you, don't worry, you know, it's nothing serious. Next time there is a crisis, the young person is uh, really not uh, willing to seek help again. And this, unfortunately, is something that um, we have uh, seen with, with how people respond to this kind of interaction. Okay, so this is our first extract from a conversation. Uh, this is a case where the practitioner is downplaying the young person's distress. Jack is a young man experiencing suicidal thoughts. And at the start of this video, he says he feels miserable. So these are just extracts of very long conversations. Um, so we're giving you a little bit of background, but this is a young man defining his own situation as if he's feeling miserable. I feel like miserable kind of sums it up yet in your face you know when you're speaking you have you've got a variation haven't you of your expression you know you smile and things like that yeah so you have times when you clearly are a miserable you're sort mm. of enjoying things or you're able to give the impression that you're enjoying things yeah okay so what you see in this um in this dialogue is that the practitioner invalidates um, the word miserable, which the young person is using to describe themselves. So they say they feel miserable and, and the practitioner almost provides evidence against the appropriateness of that label uh, for, for the young person. Um, so he says, you know, if you were miserable, maybe your expression would then change the way it does. Um, and clearly there are times when you're not miserable, you're kind of enjoying things. And initially the young person is kind of resisting <laughs> that changing of, um, of the label. So, mm. um, but then 
you know, while the practitioner continues, um, he, he finally just says, yeah. Um, we will come back to the exchange between this practitioner and this young person, uh, because this is a case where the young person is presented to services as suicidal, but the practitioner is challenging that, saying that they shouldn't have come to emergency services because they are not really suicidal. Okay, so let's see another type of interaction, a more positive one, where the practitioner is acknowledging the young person's distress. We've got Sarah. Um, Sarah is a young woman presenting after suicide attempt, and she has just described having rapid shifts in mood. It goes like this. Hmm. You said it's kind of like something or nothing, but is it because you can find the words or is it because there's literally no explanation that you just feel so different ones? Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. It will come over me like, I'll admit it sometimes, I'll just find myself changing and then I'll be down again. Yeah. And I don't know why. Mm. It sounds like it's quite exhausting. Because it must sound like you almost don't know where you are from day to day, even then. I'm fighting like every day, myself. Yeah. I'm so tired. Okay, you see the difference with the previous interaction. You've got slightly longer extract. But here the practitioner is really interested in how the person is feeling and probing the person's feelings, uh, trying to understand better what the experience is like for the young person. So it's providing an tentative explanation, waits for the young person to nod or agree or disagree. And um, in the end, it's a very validating and legitimizing uh, dialogue because it keeps, um, the practitioner keeps saying, I understand it's quite exhausting for you. So the concern is legitimized, it's not dismissed. It must sound like you don't know where you are from day to day. And this kind of validation makes the person open up more. So notice the difference with the previous extract. By the end of the conversation, the young person wasn't saying anything, just, mm. Yeah, but here the person is offering more and more information. I'm fighting like that every day myself. We find this over and over again in the scripts. It's not just these examples. Um, the more the practitioner takes time to listen and ask probing questions and provide some explanations, but then waits for a center descent, the more the young person shares about their experience. Just saying, I can see you're struggling can make all the difference. I still want to acknowledge my distress, even if you can't offer me help. Don't downplay what I'm feeling. Just because I look okay doesn't mean I'm feeling okay. I can tell if you're taking me seriously by your body position and tone of voice. So these are actually tips that our young people provided for practitioners. Uh, after having had experience, unfortunately, in some cases, even year-long experiences of services. As you notice, it's very minimal what they're asking. Listen, just see that I'm struggling, don't downplay what I'm feeling, uh, and so on. And this is a, a slightly longer quote from, from them. You're really distressed. You're in a lot of pain. I think that kind of acknowledgement alone can be really powerful for someone who feels like they're completely alone, isolated, and they don't feel like they even have control over their own mind. Okay, so let's move now to um, objectification and how we can avoid it. Um, what is objectification? It's kind of treating a subject as an object treating a person as if they're just a problem. Maybe a problem to be fixed or a collection of signs or symptoms or a category of type of patient. Now, it's very important that for our young people, a diagnosis is not necessarily bad. Diagnosis can be empowering, can be comforting, can be a, a means to achieve something, maybe to get more support. Um, but at the same time, what they seem to object to is to being diagnosed too quickly, is to being labeled um, immediately during the conversation. So it's enough maybe that they talk about how their mood is or how their thoughts are, but the practitioner says, oh, maybe, you know, this is what you are. You know, maybe you are depressed, maybe you've got anxiety. And that feels to them a bit dehumanizing. You know, it's like 
now I'm a label, I'm no longer a person. And so all the support that is being offered to me it depends on that particular label. There is nothing more I can offer about my own experience that is going to change what the practitioner is going to do. When you are a young person, your identity is so malleable, it's very easy for a label to become enmeshed with your sense of identity. So that's another reason why it's very important to be careful with labels, because for a young person, a label can be self-defining. We saw earlier that they're really easily influenced about how people think of them um, because they're still finding out who they are. And so um, the label, uh, if premature, can be um, difficult. So um, in this extract uh, is an example of putting the young person in a box. Um, Jack is a young man experiencing suicidal thoughts. And in this video, the practitioner labels Jack as non-suicidal. Same case that we saw earlier. What, what kind of plans would you have had this evening? I, it was, I got a few events on because I'm part of a rugby, skiing and tennis. And they all have different events on tonight that I could have gone to. I see. So we could safely say you are not going to end your life, do well, something that would have... Tonight? Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't have had to do it tonight, no. You wouldn't have, okay. So maybe there was a bit of miscommunication because they brought you here because they were saying that you were suicidal and... No, I am, but I've got... You are? I've got... I've, I feel I can... I mean, I haven't done it yet. Okay, so um, I think you recognize the uh, same characters as in the previous exchange. Um, he, this is a university student, a young man. Uh, the night that is brought in, uh, someone uh, called services saying that they were afraid he would end his life. So um, he accessed services um, because he was thought to be suicidal. Here, the practitioner again challenges uh, the suicidal label over and over again. Uh, initially, just because he had plans for that evening. So saying, oh, if you had all these things to do this evening, that obviously you weren't thinking about ending his life. Um, the young man is clearly uncomfortable. That's much more obvious in the video. We are doing what we can, but it's clearly uncomfortable with, with, with a line of questioning. Um, he, he admits that he probably wouldn't have done anything that particular night, but that he feel he has thoughts about suicide. Um, and yet, you know, the more the, the practitioner insists that that's not what's happening, the more indecisive and doubtful the young man feels. Towards the end, he can't even finish the sentence. He starts the sentence three times. Uh, and you can feel it in the tone of voice and everything, that they are no longer sure that they should keep saying that they are. Um, there is a little bit of controversy about this particular script because in the UK, um, mental health care uh, emergency services, suicidal uh, is a label that is very technical and is used in risk assessment. So it makes a huge difference for the practitioner whether they tick that box or not uh, in terms of what they're doing next. So there could be also something going on there about the culture in services, but still it doesn't look like the experience of the person is explored at all. You know, she never asks about what kind of thoughts he had. Never ask to explain or elaborate on what kind of thoughts he had. Just challenges the fact that he was suicidal because he wouldn't have ended his life that particular night. Okay, this is a more positive exchange. Here the practitioner tries to see the whole person. So Dan is a young man presenting after suicide attempt. So very similar situation. The practitioner treats his suicidal ideation as complex and grounded in many parts of his life. I think from what you have said hmm? that you've been struck by a nut. A nut is a negative automatic thought. Hmm? And what's happened is since you've left the army, which is something you, know, you succeeded to get in the army, you come out the army, but you are in town, nothing much is going on. Hmm. You can't go back. You're not going to the gym. Hmm. Your physical exercise is going down. Yeah. Hmm. It's hard for you to get a job. You struggle with your mom because she doesn't understand the situation. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So what happens is you get this build up of negative thoughts in your mind. Yeah. Negative thoughts, negative thoughts. All of a sudden, 
what will happen is yeah. what the heck i'm opening the medicine yeah. cabinet paracetamol so you see what happens here um the practitioner is really reconstructing the potential reasons that this person had to feel to 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 feel low um bringing everything in from the conversation she had with this young man everything you know what their experience was previously being in the army the relationship with his parents um really trying to understand what is going on based on what the young person just told them um there is a real attempt to um to investigate and it's probably not very easy to see from this kind of contributions mm, yeah but this is a kind of a positive yeah like it, the person was nodding was involved was following the conversation and at the end of the encounter uh, you reported feeling much better uh, for for the chat that they had with the with the practitioner saying um they gave me the impression that they were really trying to understand what was going on with me i wasn't just a problem i wasn't just a label i was myself with my own life history so the post visit interview um that's what they said i had no one to talk to i had nothing and then i spoke to him and the team and they understood they actually listened and understood what i was on about he basically explained why i did it i didn't know until he told me um so the interviewer asked what was the most helpful part of the assessment most helpful that they understood me that's never happened before in my life no one has actually understood me what would you do if you had suicidal thoughts again talk to someone first i wouldn't do it i talked to someone first it's a very positive effect of this interview again the tips from the young people for the practitioners fully explore my concern before labeling me Acknowledge that I'm an individual and my story matters. A well-founded diagnosis can be validating, but premature labels cause lasting damage. Explain that the label is just one part of a bigger picture. Life is hard and instead of them dealing with it in a more holistic way, they just, they've just been put into this box. It's like a simple explanation for something that has many complexities. Okay, so moving forward, um, affirm the capacity to contribute to change. Uh, initially, the academic part of the research team was working with the idea of responsibility. Because in philosophy, as you know, when we're thinking about agency, we are really thinking about um, the person who is an agent is the person who uh, can take responsibility for what they do. Uh, and also kind of determine what they do on the basis of their goals, but also be regarded as praiseworthy or bl blameworthy, depending on how people see what, um, what the agent does. We moved to talking about the capacity to contribute to change because for the young people, the word responsibility was just too much. They thought that for young people in a crisis, struggling with their mental health, the thought of being responsible for anything um, by themselves without adequate support was uh, too burdensome and something that they couldn't have dealt with properly. So how does a practitioner affirm the capacity that the person has to contribute to change? Acknowledge past achievements, recognize multiple factors contributing to a crisis. We just saw that with the previous extract. Emphasize feasible goals for the future that the young person can actually achieve. Um, and avoiding blaming the young person. Practitioners should acknowledge that the young person's current state of distress is not their fault or a direct result of their actions, but they should also encourage the young person and note that they have the inner strength and capacity to redirect and change their current circumstances, almost like a scaffolding approach. To me, it's surprising that this is a direct quote from one of our young person with lived experience. It looks so clear and so beautiful from a philosophical point of view to try and describe this collaboration between uh, the healthcare practitioner and the young person uh, building back the confidence and the capacity to change as scaffolding to me it's just a really really beautiful image that i think sometimes philosophers struggle with but um, it's um, it says very well what we are trying to do so the problem is that assigning responsibility is usually linked to praising or blaming, whereas assigning responsibility is part of the recognition that the person is an agent. Blaming is detrimental to therapeutic relationship. 
This is a point made brilliantly by Anna Pickard, who was at Birmingham now, um, is at John Hopkins University. She developed this framework, Responsibility Without Blame, which she initially applied to personality disorders, then to addiction, then to other areas of healthcare, where she claims that it's important in healthcare practice, in clinical practice, to consider the person responsible because otherwise they wouldn't take um, initiative in their own treatment and their own recovery process, but not blameworthy because blame doesn't benefit the person. Um, and uh, that's one possibility keeping responsibility, avoiding blame. Um, another approach by Brandenburg and Strebels is quite different, is the nurturing stance. So they suggest that actually blame is helpful sometimes. They invite us to think about how we blame children. We don't blame children because we think they are responsible for doing something wrong. We blame them because we are teaching them that certain things should be avoided in the future. And our approach is nurturing. We're not blaming in, with a view to punish. We're blaming in a view to, with a view to um, help them develop. So um, there are different, this, I'm just showing this slide to say that in philosophy and in ethics, there are different ways in which people are trying to solve this tension between the responsibility and blame and trying to think of a notion in the healthcare context that doesn't have uh, the burdens of responsibility, but at the same time enables the patient to feel like an agent in some way. So what capacities do, I, do agent, uh, agents have? It's important to distinguish um, between the young person's capacity to assume responsibility, which in some contexts places a burden on young people, and the young person's capacity to contribute to change, which doesn't necessarily place this kind of burden, and is compatible with the young person's behavior being just one of many factors in their mental health. So it's important that they don't feel that their poor mental health is their own fault because it's never the case. You know, the, the factors that contribute to these kind of situations are multiple. Okay, so this is extract five. This is a positive interaction where the practitioner recognizes the person's previous achievements. Ron had overdosed many times in the previous years, but then started attending therapy and stopped overdosing um, as frequently. It's really hard to change things when you've got coping strategies or whatever. It's really, really hard to change it. And you've done really well to change. I saw you last year. I saw you a few times. Yeah. When you talk about your bad times, that's how I remember you. That's how I met you. And things are completely different for you now. Yeah, yeah, I'm doing better. I think you should be really proud of what you've done. A lot of people don't manage to do it. I think you've done really, really well. Okay, so what, what's happening there is that uh, the person is empowered because what they've done in the past to try and improve their situation um, is actually something that the practitioner recognizes as something really difficult to do. Um, and and uh, you know, the conversation continues along these lines for quite a bit longer, but the person really in the end feels that they have the resources to improve again, because of course they presented to services because they overdosed again, but they don't feel like they failed themselves. They feel like they are in a trajectory uh, that is uh, positive, that's progressing. Unfortunately, this is extract six is a negative one. Uh, it's one of the most difficult for me. Uh, when I was watching the video, it was very difficult to watch. Um, so I'm in a way glad that you're not watching the video, but this is a, an interaction between a practitioner and a young man who uh, overdosed. And where the practitioner, uh, I can't put it any differently, blames the young man for not considering the effects of uh, his actions on other people. So when you say you are concerned about the impact on other people, had you thought about how, what would happen for the people that found you? I, I had, I didn't want it to be my sister. Okay, but you said she was in the house at the time, so it could have been her. It could have been her, yeah. It's much longer. Um, it's almost a forensic style of questioning um, where the practitioner uh, keeps asking the person whether they felt bad that uh, their friends had called the emergency services after what the young man said. Um, 
and uh, basically making him think that um, what he had done had kind of uh, difficult repercussions on members of his family, including his sisters. Um, very, very unpleasant kind of conversation to, to have, uh, but where you can definitely see that there is a blaming uh, of the young person that is not particularly helpful um, in any way. It's not kind of making him reconsider what he did. If anything, it makes him feel even worse about himself than he felt at the beginning. So here are the top tips uh, of our young people for practitioners. If I feel ashamed, I'm less inclined to share information about how I acted the way I did. It is important to acknowledge how far I have come. You don't want the message to be, it's not relevant how you're feeling, just imagine what this would do to everyone around you. Okay, so we got to the last one. So with adequate support, an agent can participate in decision-making. Um, I mean, participation in decision-making is another core aspect of agency. A lot of people are talking about partnership now between patients and healthcare practitioners. And certainly the idea that uh, young people can be involved in um, their own uh, decisions about the futures is, is, is quite important. At the same time, young people repeated they didn't want the burden of having to make the decision themselves. They don't want practitioners to ask them, there is this treatment A and this treatment B, what do you want? Because they feel that in a moment of crisis, they don't have the confidence to make that decision. And also they don't have the relevant expertise to know which treatment is better for them, but they want it to be a dialogue. They wanted their needs and preferences to be taken into account in the final decision, not to drive the final decision without any other factor. So they say, ask for my perspective, explain your perspective, and let's agree on a plan together. If the young person and practitioner don't have an open discussion about goals for treatment and the young person's preferences, they may end up working against each other throughout the duration of treatment and may make little to no progress. So in this extract, um, the young person is almost pressurized to resume medication. So this is a person who had experienced suicidal thoughts, had been prescribed antidepressants in the past, but stopped taking them after a few days because he said he started feeling very anxious when he was taking them. Do you want to try and address your mood? What do you mean? Do you want it to be different from what it is? Yeah. Yeah. So what do you need to start doing? Taking tablets. Yeah, because what dose did you say you thought it was? 20 milligrams. 20. You need to give it a go, Luke. So what you see here is a very, very patronizing um, attitude. It's almost, uh, you know, asking, almost telling the young person, you know what to do, why don't you do it? Um, there is no attempt to explore the reasons why the young person has stopped taking medication because the young person had started taking it and has stopped for a reason, but the reason is not explored by the practitioner in the encounter. The reason is something that we hear from the young person at the end of the encounter when in the post uh, encounter interview. Um, and again, kind of very forensic approach, you know, teacher to, to student almost, you know, what is it that you need to do? Why are you not doing it? Um, that, that kind of feeling. Um, okay, extract eight is very different. This is a practitioner asking a young person's perspective on attending grief counseling. So Sam is a young man presenting after suicide attempt. His mother recently passed away and his mother is very important uh, role in his life. And in this video, the practitioner asked for some perspective on grief counseling before prescribing it to him. On the subject of, of your mom, have you ever had any counseling, any grief counseling no. or around loss of a family member? No. Mm. Has anyone ever suggested it to you? The mental health did in London. They suggested counseling for me. Mm. Yeah. Okay. What do you think about that? It's just talking about it. I just don't want to keep doing it. But I, you know, it upsets me. I don't want to feel upset. I don't want to talk about mom. Okay. So here, um, grief counseling is an option that the practitioner is considering, but the young person 
you know, uh, tried it before, doesn't think it's going to be helpful for them. And in the end, uh, that's not the solution that they uh, reach together. So this is just the beginning of the conversation about potential treatment and what the young person is telling the practitioner about not wanting to think about their mom is going to be taken into account in the way in which a treatment is sought. So top tips of our young people for um, practitioners, take time to explain what you recommend. Ask me, I have heard about the treatment option. Ask about my concerns about treatment. Don't make up your mind about treatment before asking my perspective. Don't ask me what type of treatment I need. I prefer to explore and discuss this together. Be transparent about potential problems. Okay, so uh, when we had analyzed all these conversations, first in the group of academic researchers, um, then with the young people and then in a circle looking for themes, we came up with this, um, <laughs> this thing, which we call the agencia ladder. Um, and it's basically the idea that all these different elements of agency are almost in an hierarchical order where validation and legitimization are essential, are basic. Our young people kept saying that that would be enough. Actually, they don't want anything else. If possible, validation and legitimization should always be there. They take no more time than uh, any other conversation lacking validation and legitimization. And those together with, um, you know, trying not to label too soon or not you know, try not to objectify the person are the most fundamental aspects of the agency stance. And on those, the other two aspects can be built uh, where they require a lot more complexity, affirming the capacity that the person has to contribute to change and involving the person in decision-making. Now, obviously those couldn't happen if there is no validation and legitimization, because if the person is not asked about their experiences, those experiences cannot be taken into account in decisions. So we feel really that there is a progression between the first few elements that we looked at together and the last two that are more complex. Um, and young people are extremely aware of the lack of resources in mental health care uh, services. They are aware that um, healthcare practitioners are burned out, that they have you know, um, very little time in between one patient and another, that they may see 20 young people in one night. They know all of this, they appreciate that. And that's why um, very often they are not really worried about being offered further support or you know, being given the solution to their problem. What this seems really important to them is being listened to. I've been given the impression that someone wants to understand them, even if in the end they don't manage to understand them. Um, and that we feel is what really matters to agents in this context, making them feel that they are agents. They're not objects just because you know, they've had encountered problems, but they have a role to play in these conversations. They first being listened to and then participating in the decisions. So if you're interested in the project, there are lots of further resources that you can access. We have a number of open access papers and the paper um, that mostly describes this um, research in much more detail is, as I said, coming out in theory and psychology. Um, MacBean also created a podcast summarizing what we found in these interactions. That's mainly the voice of young people, but all of us contributed to it. Um, and there are also two webinars, I think probably even three webinars um, on, on YouTube available where we um, kind of uh, talk about these issues for practitioners, so aimed uh, primarily at practitioners. So this is our website. And finally, just thanking our funders, all the people attending the emergency department and the practitioners who very bravely and generously agreed to be recorded. Thank you very much. <laughs>